thank you for joining Fireweed Metals Live Investment Summit today, hosted by SIX. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for today, Brandon McDonald, CEO and director of the company, and Dr. Jack Milton, their chief geologist. The team's going to walk us through a few presentations today, and after we'll be going into a live Q&A session. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them using the Q&A chat found on the right-hand side of your screen at any time today. And as always, this event is being recorded. It's going to be available on SIX.com in the coming days. But uh, to get us started, Brandon, I'd like to hand things over to you. Uh, feel free to take it away. Thanks. I'm not going to try to be uh, too formally walk through this presentation. I think what most people should want to hear from or about today is is uh, Jack's presentation, which really focuses on the, the hot drill result from uh, three weeks ago um, and, and our new thinking around Boundary and Boundary West. Um, but I'm going to go through a, a, a broader corporate update here uh, as you know to get a kick us off. Um, just a reminder, we're, we're a proud member of the Discovery Group. Um, some some <clears throat> list of the members uh, there, but also some notable alumni, I suppose, having graduated recently, Great Bear and Great Bear Royalties, uh, both with uh, excellent transactions in the last year. Um, you know, we, we hope that we uh, impress upon people that, that Fireweed takes seriously, uh, not just what we're trying to do, which is, you know, beyond... Uh, explore and develop and, and potentially build and operate mines is really that focus on critical minerals, um, which are essential for, for the modern life that we enjoy and that, that certainly enjoy in the West and that people elsewhere in the world would like to enjoy. So as, as the world moves uh, you know, into the future and the green transition and, and the modernization of developing economies, uh, we think it's important to be mining these, these metals responsibly. Um, and we're, we're happy to be doing that in partnership with local communities and indigenous groups. Uh, and critically, our, our core value, you know, we, we've said here is respect and stemming from that is integrity, including honesty and and respect for the people we work with and people who work for us and, and as well as the people we're partnered with. Um, we hope that we project this as well. Uh, we try to be uh, as transparent as we're allowed to be within the context of being a public company. Um, and we try to be forthcoming with, with the opportunities and challenges uh, on our projects. Um, and yeah, look, so why fireweed and why now? Um, <clears throat> I, I think, my I've said this before, uh, you know, we're really hopefully in the, in the nascent stages of a, a bull market for, for commodities uh, and, and specifically metals uh, and specifically critical metals as, as that transition happens. Um, we've had a few false starts over the last couple of years. It seems every time the market's kind of started to get going, uh, the, the, our legs have been kicked out from underneath us by, uh, COVID, recession, trade wars, et cetera. Um, but it's coming and, and you know, we firmly believe that the best projects, you know, as you get that transition and that, that sector rotation, the best companies with the best projects are the first ones to move and, and ultimately move the furthest. And, and we'd like to think that we've got a pretty special uh, bunch of projects. Uh, board, I, so look, there's, there's um, a lot of people to focus on here. Um, Myself, I think you know, John Robbins, our chairman, an incredible amount of success. Uh, rounding out the rest of the board, George Kaczynski, Adrian Rothwell, Marcus Chalk, uh, Peter Hempstead, who actually this morning was announced to be uh, the new CEO of Bluestone, uh, graduating from CFO, uh, Peter Harrison from Ibera Capital, and Jill Donaldson, um, you know, recently having joined the board. Uh, so we feel we're, we're a pretty strong board. And this is the old capital structure, or I should say this is the current. And, you know, so so this is as good a place to any, you know, as we announced um, last week, uh, a $35 million financing with 20 million of that coming from the Lundin family, um, significantly changing this capital structure, um, really adding about 40 million shares, which we fully appreciate is uh, dilutive. Um, however, you know, critically, we wanted to make sure that these shares were in strong hands and, and that it's possible to dilute without increasing your float. And, that, and that's a critical aspect of this financing is, is placing all these shares within the hands of the Lundin family, uh, you know, existing shareholders and, and a very small percentage of new shareholders who we think, you know, we have reason to believe will be supportive and useful. Um, so this is, this is critical for us. This gives us well, well over a year runway, uh, that 35 million being added to the 5 million we already had in the bank. Um, so it is going to be the biggest ever uh, uh, program for us next year. 
Um, and, uh, you know, that's building upon the biggest ever program already in 2022. Uh, so we're excited uh, and we're hoping to close out 2023 with, with still, I would say, 10 to 15 million in the bank, depending on how, how big we go this summer and, and what programs and, and optional programs we throw in. Um, but it's going to be a big, exciting year, and we're, we're glad everyone's uh, here to follow us. Um, like, I think we're going to really focus on on um, Mac Pass today, and I'm going to leave that to Jack. But so I'm going to quickly fast forward through Mac Pass, and I'm going to I'm going to talk a bit about Mac Tongue and our, and our thoughts and plans there, a bit about Gain River, um, and then hand it over to Jack critically to to get into the results. And and really, I would like I've I've sort of pulled some good questions uh, that I got from from some forums in the last couple of days for us to answer at the end, but I would really encourage people to ask other questions. Um, I think this these town halls are most effective when it's a dialogue, and, and so we're hoping to be able to get that dialogue going here at the end. So, uh, you know, look, I think most people, if, you, if you're not, if you're new to this story, uh, welcome. If you're not new, uh, you know, I think you know that the recent history we had bought Tom and Jason off HUD Bay, you know, started with a 54 square kilometer, 54 square kilometer land package, expanded that to about 940, really um, tracing that this major crustal scale fault there, the Hess fault, um, because we believe that the intersection of that fault and these second order faults was, was sort of a focal point for the creation of the, the shale hosted base metal deposits. Um, and that that has proved so far to be correct, and and we've made some incredible discoveries there, and and our thinking is constantly evolving around this, and and Jack will get into that, but you know I think when you reflect upon, um, you know the the 2018 studies, uh, both the resource and and the preliminary economic assessment, it's so important to to understand the context of those were a snapshot at a point in time, um, we want to do new snapshots on these. Um, and it's going to start looking dramatically different, right? So, so that old resource, just Tom and Jason, the 11.2 million tons indicated, 39.5 million tons inferred, you know, at around the 10% zig like equivalent. We're expecting a, a massive shift in that, uh, you know, as we move towards the next resource update, and corresponding with with the massive change in resource, massive opportunity to improve uh, the economics on it as well. Um, and there's so much more than just improving the the resource that goes into those improved economics you know we've had we've had such a great commitment from the government on improving the access road which is a cost we'd included in the 2018 pea um we've done so much to improve metallurgy uh, look at improving uh you know the, the starter pit you know uh initial mine life um you know that there's there's a lot of opportunity to improve this uh you know even if we just did another study on tom and jason it would it would still be so much better than this. So we're we're hoping people are excited by that, and, and we're hoping that um, we're able to deliver those numbers and and uh, really impress people. And so, like, and that is the, what we're targeting is is the the much abused term of a tier one project, right? And and what is tier one? I, I guess that's sort of in the eye of the beholder. Everyone's got a different definition. To me, um, you know, I, I see a tier one zinc project, for example, one that can ship, you know, 200 and 250,000 tons plus of concentrate a year, uh, maybe more, uh, you know, something that's so, so in and around the top 10 um, mines in the world in terms of metal shipped should be in the first or second quartile of costs um, and should have a long multi-cycle mine life. So if you're missing any of those, it doesn't mean you're a bad project. Um, it could be a very good project, but it's not something I would consider tier one. Um, so, you know, that 2018 PEA certainly scratched uh, one of those three, you know, itches. So it, it's got uh, a multi-cycle mine life. We would expect that to be longer the next study. Um, sat just, you know, around the top 15 in terms of production profile. And it was just outside the second quartile in terms of, of costs. But we think all of those things, we can make just a little bit of an adjustment, a little bit of an improvement and really get to that that tier one level. Um, so, you know, we've delivered a big drill program this year. That's made a big difference. Um, you know, we've got ongoing trade-off studies. We just released the metallurgical test results at Boundary Zone, which were excellent. You know, so much different than Tom and Jason, so much coarser of a grind, you know, great high recoveries with, with such low energy inputs. Um, 
you know, and, and all this works towards uh, ultimately updating the resource and, and PEA while in parallel, uh, you know, doing the necessary engagement consultation, um, you know, early baseline programs to progress with intent towards eventually building this, if, if that's what it comes down to. And, you know, and so critically with, with the uh, Lundin family being cornerstone shareholders now, we can't build this if we want, right? So, um, you know, we're in such a different position now than we were, you know, just a couple months ago. So Mac Tung, uh, right next to Mac Pass, which is really the, the, the critical aspect to, to deciding to purchase this, it was not that we were out looking for tungsten, although tungsten is so unique in terms of supply demand and, and, and the critical nature of it. But being right next to Mac Pass, you know, we were already in, engaging with the governments and, and First Nations and communities in the area. Um, we saw significant operational synergies. Um, and, and we saw a very advanced, mature project. And, you know, this is a project that has had a feasibility study and that has been through the environmental assessment with a positive recommendation. So this is something that we're looking at, trying to figure out if we can kind of pick up where North American tungsten left off, roughly, um, you know, we see potentially an opportunity to really fast track this uh, through permitting um, and, and into construction. Um, so a, a advanced stage, you know, really likely nearer term project um, and one that we're quite excited about. And tungsten, you know, critical minerals can be critical for a lot of reasons, essentially, you know, the essential nature being important, but also, you know, the strategic nature and, and with 85% of, you know, tungsten mine supply being China and, and it being so tightly controlled there, um, this is one, this is a metal that, that Western governments, not surprisingly, are extremely anxious about. Uh, this is one where they would love to support uh, production ex China, and, and this is something we would love to help with. And, and you know, critically, Mac Tung could could be a very, very, very outsized producer. And and this is by virtue of the fact that you look at sort of this this chart here with grade on the x axis and contained metal on the y axis. That Mac Tung is such an incredible outlier. It's it's a beast of a deposit. Um, that's unlike anything else in the world. So, um, you know, we really think it it can be sort of maybe the number one tungsten mine in the world for for 40 to 50 years, right? And, and what an incredible proposition that is. Um, so look, as we as we go along here, uh, we'll keep you informed, but but we're excited about our ability to to push that project forward. Um, and Gaina River, you know, for Gaina River, I, I would really encourage people. We did a presentation on this. It's on our YouTube page. Um, you know, it was referred to to looking forward, um, and and Jack goes into a lot of details about about why we picked up Gaina River, and and the short story of it is this is a project that was explored uh, extensively by um, um, Rio Tinto in the seventies. They were looking for a typical sort of MVT style, you know, um, back reef, flat lying zinc lead deposit. They found it, you know, there's quite a bit of mineralization there, but didn't really make the cut given the remote location. And really the, the thinking changed when uh, in 2018, um, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Turner at Laurentian University and, and Dr. David Broughton um, uh, at Ivanhoe co-authored a paper comparing Gaina River to Kapushi. And uh, again, I'm not going to belabor the details. I would check out Jack's uh, talk on this and, and that um, presentation I was uh, referring to on our YouTube site. But there's so such a unique oppor opportunity here. And everything that, that Rio Tinto did was not how you would do it if you were looking for a Kapushi style project in, in terms of where they drilled, how they drilled, how they explored. So um, we're super excited by you know early results this summer so we did it we did an extensive gravity survey uh proved up some of the historic soils um took some really incredible rock samples um so and, and mapped out where we think the reef fronts potentially are so it's it's going to be um a very interesting year next year on this T tbd uh how much we spend on on gain a river but but it's definitely a unique opportunity and having said that fully realizing that the, the bar for success in this project is very high by virtue of the location. But you find something like a Kapushi, which is 11 or 12 million tons at 34% zinc, that, that exceeds virtually any bar, right? So um, obviously something we're very excited about. 
Uh, so that's it for me. Um, so I will hand it over to Jack to talk about uh, the recent hits at Boundary Zone and our evolving uh, evolving thoughts on the geology. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brendan. So uh, yeah, as Brendan mentioned, I'm going to be mostly talking about uh, Mac Pass and sort of how we made the discovery uh, at Boundary Zone and a lot of detail about the geology and what we think makes uh, up the potential for a very large system at Boundary Zone. So I acknowledge that uh, projects located on the traditional territories of the Cascadena and the First Nation of Natural Act done. And I'll be making some forward-looking statements. And this is just the overview of the presentation. So we're going to go through sort of the old and the new. So what's changed in the last five years since we just had Tom and Jason? Um, and what's new in our thinking and our approach and our results? And I'll go over that approach in, in you know, how we approach exploration, what do we do, what methods do we use, and how do we put them all together uh, to try and make discoveries. And, and then we'll talk about the discovery at Boundary Zone and the geology, how did it form, and, and you know what goes in, what ingredients do we have here for a large uh, deposit. And we're going to talk about uh, a best drill hole yet that we released, uh, when was that, last week, um, and uh, go over some of the details for that and what's coming up next for five weeks. So the old and the new. So on the left here, we have the old. And and really, this, as Brandon mentioned, was the 2018 resource that we put out at Tom and Jason. And it was put out in early 2018. So it only has 2017 and earlier drilling within that resource. And it's somewhat stale dated. Um, and the 2018 PEA is built upon the, that resource. Um, and so these numbers, as you know, Brandon mentioned, are a snapshot in time. Um, but we now think that that looks uh, potentially quite different. And also the, the model for mineralization in the district, this is a Selwyn basin. It's uh, one of the most prolific zinc basins on earth. And a model was developed uh, called the SEDEX model in this basin, actually at the, the Tom deposit. Um, and these old ideas have been sort of superseded by some new research that suggests that mineralization actually formed uh, by replacement in the subsurface rather than the exhalative activity. And that's the X in ZX is exhalative. Um, and, and this is, you know, perhaps somewhat of a subtle academic difference between these deposits um, or models about how these deposits form, but it makes a really significant difference it, when you're an explorer and you're applying these concepts uh, to a search space, it, it opens up a huge search space if you use this replacement model. And uh, mineralization can form in, in the whole stack of rocks that's that's formed at the time of mineralization, not just the one layer that would be formed um, at that time of exhalative activity if you use that model. And so what's new? We've expanded the property significantly. We've acquired multiple packages of claims, and now we're at almost a thousand square kilometers uh, of ground. Uh, we acquired Mactown earlier this year. Um, since the 2018 resource, we've done five years of drilling. That's about 22,500 meters of drilling. We've had many successful step outs, um, including lots of higher grade infill drilling uh, within the known deposits, in addition to multiple new discoveries, and perhaps the most significant of which is the discovery of, of Boundary Zone West. And at Boundary West, we have high-grade massive sulfide mineralization. We have high-grade laminated mineralization, similar to what you'd see at, at Tom and Jason. And those three images on the left, those are sort of, sort of these classic laminated textures. Uh, so when I say laminated mineralization, that's kind of what I'm referring to there. And, and we've also discovered Howard's Pass style mineralization that's hosted by much older rocks. And Brandon kind of gave an overview of the district, but just to get you situated, Tom Jason here, either side of the Canal Highway. Um, end zone was not in the 2018 resource, but we'd anticipate putting a resource on that in the next resource update. Uh, and the same with uh, Boundary Zone and, and Boundary West. And those do not have resource on them right now. And um, we anticipate putting out the inaugural resource uh, for that area next year. 
And the Mahaktung project is just on the northeast side of the property that Brandon talked about that. I'm really not going to focus on that. You know, it is this this sort of freak of nature in terms of tungsten deposits. It's it's both extremely high grade and extremely large. Uh, and normally in tungsten deposits, you only get one of those. Uh, and at Mahaktung, we have both. So what's our approach for exploration? Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we we've, we've sort of ran with this new idea that was developed um, a few years ago by researchers working in the area. And we've used this to open up the search space of much um, older parts of the stratigraphy where we might anticipate the deposits may form. And we're using that idea, um, you know, all you need is, is mesoliferous fluids going through there. You need some kind of structure or, or method to, to focus those fluids and a reactive host rock um, to deposit the metals. And we, we've, we've used that idea um, to search in other parts of the pro property that were perhaps underexplored in the past and it had been um, overlooked or, or not focused on as much as those sort of ZX layers um, where, you, where the, the old model would predict mineralization would be found. And we're true believers in innovation and we, we like to use a, a data-driven and predictive approach to exploration. And, and, and with that comes the, the adoption, the early adoption of technology. We've tried many different kinds of, of, of uh, new technology in, in the project, including passive seismic surveys. Um, we've flown LIDAR, and that's critical in, in the ground gravity surveys that have been so successful for us. Uh, we've tried muon tomography, um, core scanning, you can see some some core scanning images uh, with a massive sulfide zone uh, on this slide. We've tried all kinds of different soil samples, SGH, MMR, BNC, Horizon, Acroregia. Um, and a lot of testing of the, these technologies has been enabled by superclusters. And these are uh, federal initiatives that have funded uh, projects and provided partial funding uh, that we've benefited from to pay for some of these uh, methods and have de-risked them allowing a, a junior company like us to be able to try some of these out in the exploration environment. And we're advocates of good science. We've, we've built upon a fantastic framework of geological mapping that, that existed in this part of the Yukon. Uh, and we've done a lot of that geological mapping again and, and ourselves. And we use machine learning in, in multiple different ways and, and apply it um, to, to real problems in exploration. And in the same way we use paleontology, we use stratigraphy, we've done an awful lot of sufficient geological mapping and we're supporters of academic research. Um, and this sort of all cycles back through and uh, sort of iterates our exploration approach to, to hone in on where we think the, the highest potential uh, is for finding new zinc deposits. And so what goes into our targeting stack in terms of greenfields exploration, but, but also in terms of near deposit exploration uh, or within deposit exploration. And, and, and top of this list is geology. We try to identify favorable fluid pathways. And typically these are sin sedimentary structures. These are long lived structures that form when the host rocks were forming. They're often associated with uh, diamictites that are forming as these slump branches on the seafloor. Um, we look for reactive host rocks. This could be barite layers, it could be carbonate, um, perhaps volcanic rocks, uh, and indicators of scale that we we're trying to find one of these large scale systems. <clears throat> uh, geophysics, what goes into this is, is primarily the ground gravity um, is, is the only means that we have for directly detecting uh, the deposits that we've used successfully to direct, directly detect the deposits. And with this, we fly LIDAR, and this is really important because you need a very uh, accurate and detailed terrain correction in, in such steep terrain um, to reduce the effect of, of the terrain on the gravity measurements. And we've also used a lot of uh, airborne EM and MAG, uh, but not for di direct detection of deposits, but to see the stratigraphy and the structure, um, which has then enabled us to refine the geology and iterate back through to those more prospective areas. And the geochemistry, it, this really goes hand in hand with sufficient geology. And, and in an area of, of such complex uh, glacial sediments, 
then assessing those transport directions is absolutely key in, in interpreting those soil ge uh, geochemical anomalies correctly. And every year we go through this, this very detailed exercise of economics and cost in terms of exploration. Where can we add the most value by you know, prioritizing a long list of targets? And not only where can we add the most value, but how much value can we add per dollar that we spend? Um, and we do this, this exercise every year in order to try and make our exploration the most efficient. I'm going to talk a little bit about the stratigraphy <clears throat> and the, the setting of these different deposits to give you some context for what's coming up next at Boundary Zone. So our main deposits are here at the Tom and the Jason positions in the stratigraphy. And without getting into the detail, this is a stack of sedimentary rocks, a lot of black shales in there, a lot of clastic rocks, and then those green layers are volcanic rocks. At Tom and Jason, you have these barite layers which uh, get replaced by zinc uh, and lead bearing fluids. Um, and you end up with, with these large laminated stratiform deposits with zones of massive sulfide at their core. But Boundary Main is hosted in some older stratigraphy within coarse clastic rocks. Um, it's not hosted within barite and the mineralization is dominantly a vein style of mineralization with some matrix replacement um, and class replacement of some of those coarse clastic rocks and volcanic clastics. And Boundary West is hosted in some old rocks still, so down into some mid Devonian rocks. <clears throat> and here we see different styles of mineralization again. We see the laminated style. We see the reds, which are the massive sulfides, which zone out from being truly massive sulfides uh, to being sort of interlayered with uh, very silicified mudstones and replaced barite um, beds. And down in what's labeled the lower sequence there would be the Howard's Pass style mineralization. And this is hosted in late Ordovician to early Silurian aged rocks. And we call it, call it Howard's Pass style, but really it's hosted by the same age rocks as the Howard's Pass deposits, which sit about 60 or 70 kilometers away from Mac Pass. And these things are huge, over 400 million tons uh, in at Howard's Pass. Um, and the discovery of this here at Boundary West was really significant for us because this age of rock is not known to host mineralization anywhere across the Macmillan Pass district. So it's really opened our eyes in terms of what could be around us in the stratigraphy and where we're seeing all these geochemical anomalies in those age rocks, what these could represent uh, in terms of this Howard's Pass style mineralization. And this is an overview shot of uh, Boundary Zone. So we're looking down the valley there, and that is that line is the approximate trace of the Hess Fault. And this is really significant. This is one of these major crustal structures. It's a sin sedimentary fault. It has different stratigraphy on either side in, in the same uh, lithostratigraphic unit. And the, the, the mineralized zones are uh, hosted on a splay of the Hess Fault, Boundary West and Boundary May. And <clears throat> this is uh, sort of, you, you can see the drill pads there in, in those different zones. And, and the new discovery is really at Boundary West, um, which we'll get onto in the next slide here. So <clears throat> the discovery history. It was originally discovered by Kaminko in the 80s, and that would have been Boundary Main. Uh, we acquired the ground from Tech in 2018, and we drilled a couple of holes at Boundary Main in 2019 and got some um, a higher than expected zinc grades over some, some very large uh, intercepted thicknesses. And on the map here, what we're showing is the ground gravity anomalies. So this is the Bouget anomaly with uh, the first sort of trend removed. We're looking at the residual anomaly. Um, in that white outline on the map, those drill holes were all put in by fireweed uh, in 2020 and 2021. The, the 2022 drilling is not shown on this map. But you can see that, you know, if you were to remove those drill holes, there'd be a large gravity high with no drill holes in it. And this is how we made the discovery, was identifying this, this gravity high from a survey that we did in uh, early in 2020 in the field season. 
we identified this large gravity high and we pivoted and within a few weeks we had got a drill rig on there and we drilled the discovery hole in 2020. And you know why is boundary zone so important? So th this is a, a section here from Boundary Main, and you can see some of these these great results. In hole two from 2019, we had 230 meters. That's true thickness of four and a half percent zinc from surface, and that includes 100 meters of 8.7 percent zinc uh, with some from surface uh, with with some very high grade intervals such as 6.4 meters of 43 and a half percent zinc. <clears throat> And uh, hole two from 2020, so this is the hole that, that kicks back the other way on the section there, and was drilled to confirm that this is really a, a, a stock work of veins that we see, and, and we're not causing a bias by drilling in the same orientation all the time. And it confirmed this with a, a very nice hole of 213 meters of 4.4% zinc, including, again, some very high uh, vein breccia intersections, 25.5% zinc over 5.8 meters. And at Boundary Main, we've really demonstrated that it has robust potential. It's a, it's a very large scale system. And we have all the ingredients here that we think are very prospective for forming a large deposit. We have volcanic rocks, which are carbonate altered and form a reactive host rock. Um, we have evidence for rifting in these volcanic rocks and this rapid extension and very thick accumulation of coarse plastic material and a lot of diamictites in this area. Um, which we think are, are keys that could initiate um, this convection and, and fluid flow in this area. And what does it look like at Boundary Main? Well, the images below show examples of, of the, some of the various styles and it's very diverse texture at Boundary Main um, of, of mineralization. So in, in all these images, uh, the sphalerite, the zinc bearing mineral is that sort of orangey red, brick red color and some of the beige colored mineral. <clears throat> we see replacement of barite, and these are pseudomorphs of barite by pyrite. In other places, you see sphalerite pseudomorphing the barite, showing that it formed as in replacement and formed after the barite formed diagenetically. And we see these very high grade vein breccias, these uh, brittle uh, fractured breccias. We see multiple episodes of overprinting veining. That image in the top right, you see some early pyrite veins overprinted by red uh, to then beige color as phalerite veins. In the bottom left, we see massive sulfides, and that is mostly pyrite, and you can see some sort of reddish sphalerite in the middle of the image. And then coarse clastic rocks. <clears throat> we see diamectites that have uh, selective class replacement, matrix replacement, and chirpo conglomerates in the bottom right, where, where we're seeing that uh, red sphalerite replacing a lot of the matrix. And this is kind of what the, the style of mineralization uh, typically looks like at Boundary Main. <clears throat> and this is very different from the, the classic stratiform laminated mineralization, the very fine grained stuff that we see at Tom and Jason. As Brandon mentioned, the metallurgy that came back on this stuff was very, <clears throat> very favorable. And that's due to this very coarse nature of the sphalerite in these veins. Um, that required only a, a rough grind to achieve um, very good recoveries. And this is a photograph from the discovery uh, moment at Boundary West. This was back in 2020, and you can see that's, uh, that's us lifting the core boxes or the lids off the core boxes of the discovery hole. And underneath that, you can see the massive sulfides. There was 26 meters of massive sulfide in this discovery intersection. And that was hole four, and that graded 76 and a half meters of 4.2% zinc and a little bit of lead and some silver, including 24 meters of 6.5% zinc. <clears throat> and so this is the section now from Boundary West, the new discovery, and the discovery hole is the uh, shallowest dipping hole that you can see on that section that intersects that red layer, bright red, thick layer, which is the massive sulfides at Boundary West. <clears throat> These massive sulfides appear to increase in grade the further we chase them to depth. So the discovery intersection was about 4 to 6% zinc. That middle hole is running about 
seven percent zinc, seven or eight percent zinc, and the bottom hole there is running eight to ten percent zinc. So we're increasing in zinc grade. We're also increasing a bit in lead and silver in parts of that, and to a geochemically anomalous degree, uh, copper as well. <clears throat> We also see laminated mineralization. This purple layer on the left, we intersected in 2021 and discovered a very high grade zone, 10.4 meters of 23.7% zinc, including some quite high lead grades of 3.4% zinc, uh, lead, excuse me. <clears throat> And uh, <clears throat> we think that this increase in grade with depth is related to getting closer and closer to the feeder structure. And this feeder structure, what we mean by this, is where we think the fluids came from and they came up and hit this, uh, this barite layer, <clears throat> reacted with it, and dropped out the sphalerite and the galena. So it's open in that direction, <clears throat> and we drilled uh, a follow-up hole that we're going to talk about in just a second here. And this is what some of those styles of mineralization look like, the Tom Jason style <clears throat> stratiform mineralization is at the top, and that is uh, in, in the purple on the cross section. <clears throat> some more massive pyrite sphalerite in the red. And then the Howard's Pass style mineralization. So this would be on the draw hole in the right. And it occurs at depth here. And we've only hit it in a few spots where we've we've tried to hit this mineralization. We've, we've hit it. And it occurs as this silver gray sphalerite that appears to replace radiolaria within these very cherty black mudstones. And we know that it's late Ordovician to early Silurian rocks because we drilled through some graptolite bearing rocks and graptolites of fossils that are very age diagnostic of the rocks around them. And it absolutely nailed the stratigraphy to be the exact same age here as it is to Howard's Pass. Um, so we see potential at depth for additional Howard's Pass style mineralization um, in this part of Boundary West and perhaps also uh, near Boundary Main. <clears throat> so what do we have here for, in, in terms of these ingredients? You know, we have evidence for crustal scale structure, that very large splay off the Hess Fault. We have very rapid extension, accumulation of thick plastic rocks and uh, rift you know, alkalic uh, mafic volcanics. We have host rocks of different ages that host mineralization <clears throat> all throughout the stratigraphy. And we have many different styles of mineralization that indicate perhaps different uh, events that have uh, different pulses of mineralization that have exploited the same plumbing system. And we know that there's very widespread hydrothermal activity, zinc mineralization of over an area of more than two kilometers of strike at boundary zone. And we think that these things are the necessary ingredients um, that point to the potential for forming a large deposit uh, at, in the boundary area. <clears throat> and so this is the uh, drill hole that we put out a week or two ago. It's the first results from our 2022 drill program. And this is hole two that we're seeing here in the main intersection in this hole, graded 124 and a half meters <clears throat> of 12.3% zinc, 1.3% lead and 45.9 grams per ton silver. And that included a massive sulfide zone of 60 meters and 19% zinc, 1.6% lead and 64.7 grams per ton silver. <clears throat> In addition to this, there's another new zone that was, is further up the hole. You can see on the section there, that was 18 and a half meters of 6.15% zinc. <clears throat> this hole was <clears throat> not only the, the best hole we've ever drilled at Boundary Zone in terms of grade and thickness, but it's the best hole that we've drilled at Tom or Jason or Boundary Zone. And for a step out hole, at a project that's not uh, a mine in production or construction, <clears throat> it's likely one of the better holes drilled in the last decade at any zinc project globally. And 
<clears throat> just to come back to sort of the old and the new again and and look at what was in the resource and, and, and what was not in 2018. This this map shows intersections that are not in that 2018 resource and really just uh, emphasizes the, the fact that we've hit some incredible intersections, not only at Boundary Main, at Boundary West, but also at End Zone. Um, some at Jason, <clears throat> historic intersections that did not get included in that resource, and at Tom, where we've seen um, multiple intercepts um, of areas, even within infill drilling, where we think the grade may be higher than what we've modeled in the 2018 resource due to improved recovery, drilling recovery uh, over historic holes. So what's next for, for fireweed? Well, <clears throat> in uh, in the near future, we're going to be seeing the drilling results uh, roll in, and we'll be putting those the assays out uh, for those as they come in. And we'd anticipate an inaugural resource for Boundary Zone and resource updates for Tom and Jason and Macton. And when we look to the future here, um, you know, at, at Mac Pass, we have some of the largest undeveloped zinc deposits in the world. Um, one of the largest underdeveloped tungsten deposits in the world. Uh, we also have germanium and, and gallium present uh, at Boundary Zone. And all four of these are critical metals, critical minerals. And really, we have the potential here for Mac Pass to be the critical metals epicenter of the Yukon um, and a key piece in securing Canada's critical metals future. So thank you, everyone, for for listening, uh, encourage you to submit your questions and I'm gonna hand it back over here to Cam. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you guys both for uh, those great presentations. And yeah, uh, we'll be entering in the live Q&A. So if you've uh, not asked a question yet, or if you have more questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A tab found on the right hand side of your screen. Let's get started. Uh, first question from Matthias. Uh, why wasn't Tom North drilled this year? Is there sufficient drill data that's there to include it in the new resource estimate? Uh, he's remembering that there may have been talk of an open pit potential there. Yeah, well, I mean, Jack will go into this a bit, but I would say that uh, one of the problems with having such a, a big project with so many perspective areas is that you're having to make very tough decisions about what you're going to drill and what you're not going to drill. So, you know, we had <clears throat> sort of estimated a um, NPV impact of every kind of hole and and Tom North, yeah, I think Jack, we expect that to pull into the next resource. Um, so the additional holes there wouldn't have been much value. Absolutely. Um, another question we've received. Brandon, men uh, you mentioned in a recent interview that PA updates on MacPass and MacTung might not now happen until the first half of 2023. And is there some doubt about whether 23 is the best time to update these? He's just wondering about if this is the plan. Uh, and if it's just going to be more resource updates and drilling. Uh, and he also says congrats to the team. Yeah, I, look, um, we're, we're still proceeding, or at least to say that the, the, the preliminary work and trade-off studies to lead into these these economic studies are still underway. Um, but there's a question of, for example, that this recent super hot hit we had, we're not sure it gets pulled, pulled into the resource update. And so do we is now the right time to rack economics around it while we still have these very high grade zones undefined and therefore unable to influence the economics. Um, we don't know, right? So th this is like, it's going to be a decision sometime early next year as to whether or not we, we push the economics for a year, um, you know, because we'll have twice the meters next year. So it, it just will build it up, which will all really be focused. And I know this was someone else's question next year, again, really focused on resource growth and, and delineation, not infill, right? So um, there might be good reason to delay that R rather than just having to do it and then redo it right away again <laughs> to, to get the numbers right. Um, now, it's a little bit different with Mac Tung. Um, we're not looking at any resource expansion drilling at Mac Tung. And we could do, when, once that resource update is done, um, we could do a PEA, but we don't love the metallurgy that we'd be relying on, which is from the old feasibility study. So we're looking at some MET drilling uh, in 2023. So th that again, we're not sure if it makes sense to publish a study when, when there's just a little bit of incremental work that would make the study so much better. So um, 
but that one as well you know we have the ability to pretty fast track that to a pfs or fs so so maybe just doing a pea on the old met might be fine right the, 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 these are all decisions we have yet to make fair enough he wants to know what your best guess of the amount for the revised mpv is Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's, you know, it's like even like sometimes two weeks from publishing, uh, you get some pretty wild swings as, as things get nailed down. You know, we, we've said that we're targeting a billion plus. It, it feels it's not unreasonable for us to hit that. I think the big question, I think, is everyone who invests in the mining industry knows is there's been some wild CapEx blowouts lately and that there's a real, real impact on, on construction costs and operating costs uh, with not just inflation, but but a whole variety of stuff. So um, um, with that in mind, it, it, it's, it's hard to just extrapolate things from 2018 to now. So, so I don't know the impacts of that. No, fair enough. Uh, we have a few questions regarding the, the, the bridge on the Canal Road. So um, I'm going to go out of order and sort of we'll address those. We might have to go over the same topics a couple of times, but to make sure everyone has all their questions answered. We're going to start off with Shane's question. If access to the mine is planned via the Canal Road, will a bridge be built at Ross over Pelly? I would think yes. Now, the, the barge uh, at Ross River that goes over the Pelly is, is not too far from end of life. Um, and I don't feel that that highways is um, really excited about getting a new barge. Um, so this is something that that's going to require some engagement and consultation with the local First Nations and, and understand where their heads on a bridge there. I know they've talked about not just um, a cultural center on the far side of, of, of the Pelly, but also potentially relocating the village to the original historic site on that side of the river, which would absolutely require a, a bridge. Um, <clears throat> my expectation is that it, it is that it does get done. Um, it certainly makes a lot of sense, so certainly when you'd have uh, the amount of heavy traffic that, that we would have there. And I would just, I'll jump into the next one, which I think is by Doc or, or DOC here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, where he's asking, or they're asking, um, um, you know, about the 27 bridges on the canal, uh, that they're talking about finishing in 2029, um, and what's the what's the max allowable tonnage, and, and what other work is going to get done? Um, they don't bother putting in bridges now that, that have less than about 120 tons capacity. Um, so I would expect all the right and right now we're at what 40 tons is it, Jack? That they're limiting us to? Um, I think it it depends. You have to get certain variations, but uh, or, or but. Um, we would expect all of them would be 120 or more. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping they can push that 2029 20, up a bit, and I, and I think they likely will as we start to advance, um, particularly Mac Tongue, which would almost certainly be, be ready to go before then. Um, but, you know, in the road surface as well, look at the government's got to step up and do that. The good news is there's not just unallocated resource gateway funds. There's also this new multi-billion pool of federal infrastructure funds for critical mineral projects. And this certainly looks like a pretty good place for it. Um, so, so a huge part of my job is, is lobbying and on behalf of our projects and, and the good news having two projects there makes it just that much easier. Awesome. I think that's kind of the questions that are covering the the bridge, but if there are any more, we'll be happy to uh, pitch them uh, as they come in. Uh, Jacques has a question. Can you estimate the expected price you'd receive per pound of tungsten? Yeah, tungsten's priced in an MTU, um, which is 10 kilos. And, and I think currently it's about 320 US dollars per 10 kilos. Um, is that the price that we would expect to receive? I don't know. I, I think critical for Mac Tung is, is as, South Koreans did with the Shandong mine, which is meant to, to launch there, getting some sort of government commitment for a price floor on tungsten so that should um, Chinese suppliers who operate under a quota fundamentally flood the market, uh, we could be insulated from that. So um, I, I, I don't know what price we'll end up achieving, but, but I do believe the spot price right now is 320 US per MTU. Great. I think the next one from Shane is a good kind of segue um which is you know is there exploration development money expected from the u.s department of defense critical minerals initiative they don't do exploration funds um and and really tend to look at projects that are approaching final feasibility study and then construction um 
so it is something that we're engaged more on Mac tongue than Mac pass. And certainly they're, they're, they're more alarmed about tungsten than zinc. Um, but um, it is something that right now it's pretty loose engagement, but, but could be meaningful as we, you know, comes time to con construction, particularly if you're looking at construction financing and maybe some opportunities uh, with, with export development finance out of the U S to lower the cost of debt. Absolutely. Pete has another question about, um, hopefully in simple terms, but what's the significance of hitting the feeder zone? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, in simple terms, if we were to step out from that uh, hole two that we drilled this year, um, the, the hot hole that we just put out a couple of weeks ago, um, in simple terms, if we stepped towards the feeder um, and we were successful in intersecting mineralization, we'd anticipate that the grade may be higher uh, than what we hit in hole two um, because, you know, as you step towards the feeder, the, the temperature of the system increases and, and you know, the, the sphalerite uh, drops out as you come away from that feeder. So, you know, the theory is that closer you get to that feeder, the higher grade it should become. Great, absolutely. And I think that actually directly answers the next question from Pete. Um, so we'll move on to Jim's question. Are you able to say when the PP is expected to close? Uh, yeah, I would expect about two weeks from now. Um, the, the, the book basically closed <laughs> the day after. Um, it's really just takes, particularly when you have a charity flow through component, there's donors to arrange, there's there's like these multi steps. So, so we would, I, I think, like two weeks or two weeks in a day from today. So, so midweek of the 19th, I think is about right. Awesome. Uh, Pete has a question just in general about what germanium and gallium are used for. Yeah. So germanium and gallium are used in a lot of high tech applications. Um, they used a lot in LEDs, um, in solar panels in optics, um, in that kind of thing. So it, it, you know, there's, there's, um, there's small con concentrations of them at, uh, at boundary zone. And we know this is, is in the spell, right? Or at least reports to this zinc concentrate as, uh, per the results that we put out for the, for the metallurgy on boundary zone. Um, but in terms of the value of gallium and germanium, that they, they are extremely small in terms of, in comparison to where we see the value in the zinc. Um, and the real value to us is that, uh, you know, when when we're looking at all these uh, federal initiatives that, that may be developing around critical minerals, that we feel it would give our project a, a leg up in terms of assessment for um, some of those uh, potential future initiatives. Um, and that we would be, you know, a potential supplier of, of uh, more critical metals uh, to the markets. Absolutely. Uh, Shane has a question about if you're engaging the Casca in any of the current exploration, drilling and planning activities around a potential mine. Uh, yeah, of course, I mean, we'd be very remiss <laughs> not to be. Um, so Casca specifically, the Ross River Denny Council and the Art First Nation uh, out of Watson Lake. Um, I'm actually flying to Yukon this afternoon and, and we'll be in Ross River tomorrow. Um, for a community event to thank, uh, you know, the dozens of employees we have there for their hard work this, this summer. Um, but, it, you know, we recognize that, that certainly out of Ross River, that is the most affected First Nation um, and is, it is an extremely important for us to be engaged there. And, and I would say, you know, given that is my hometown, um, you know, I have a very large degree of affection for the, the village and, um, you know, hoping that our project can, can be a meaningful economic driver there. Absolutely. Uh, Adam wants to know if you're seeing in those drill holes up dip of the big latest discovery of what you're seeing. You know, surely there must be some visuals. It's, it's Adam yeah, I, information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good question, Adam. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about this a bit in the release, so this is, you know, it's all public, uh, publicly disclosed information, but in that whole uh, up dip above, um, we don't see significant amounts of massive sulfide, uh, but we do see evidence for a couple of faults, and we think that there's uh, some kind of fault that displaces 
the um, intersection that we that we hit in hole two from the rest of the massive solvite intersections that we've hit at uh, Boundary West so far by about perhaps 40 to 50 meters. Um, so no, we didn't hit a similar kind of intersection uh, in hole seven, which is the one just up tip of hole two. Um, but uh, we do think it's open towards the east and at depth, and that's the direction that we also think the feeder structure may occur. Absolutely. Michael wants to know if the government's done any transport modeling regarding number of trucks, weight, roadbed, port of the Skagaway cap capability, and also, you know, the casino and production potentially. Yeah, that's something I've been involved quite heavily in. So I've been for the last year or two, uh, joint chair of the, the Yukon Infrastructure Committee, which was a, a joint committee between the Yukon Chamber of Mines, Yukon Producer Group, and Yukon Chamber of Commerce. So I've been living a lot of Skagway discussion. Um, so there's not just ourselves and, and Casino, obviously Minto is actively producing uh, right now as well. Um, so this is something that there's been engineering firms involved in that, that they've been discussing with Skagway in terms of making sure that whatever short-term changes they make to the docks there, that it's future-proofed um, for a lot of, um, you know, eventual uh, um, concentrate loading there. And that, yeah, that could be trucks. Uh, there's been talk about uh, using the White Pass rail uh, for concentrate again, as it was used in the Faro days, um, which would allow reduced traffic through the main street of Skagway, for example. Um, so it is something that's that's um, ongoing and, and it's something that, yeah, the government not surprisingly recognizes an important piece of the puzzle. Great. Um, listen, and gentlemen, we are still receiving questions in the Q&A chat. Unfortunately, as we are coming up on time, I do want to pass things over to you as we wrap up for some closing remarks. Uh, for everyone that's qu whose questions have currently gone unanswered, uh, we will be passing this information along to the team so that they can follow up with you after today's summit. But, uh, but Brennan, Jack, over to you. Yeah, um, I just thank everyone for, for showing up. Um, obviously, a lot uh, ahead of us here, a big year. Um, we're happy to have new, such incredibly strong backers, um, happy to be able to staff up and execute this program the way we want and, and, and drill a 2023 program that we think is going to be twice the meterage and holes of, of 20, uh, uh, 22. Um, and so, you know, I, I think lots of discussion around the geology and, and I think we're extremely excited about the opportunity, but still understanding that even with twice the meters, um, there's tough decisions to make about where we drill. Um, so, so please keep in touch. Um, I'll try to answer some of these questions maybe on Twitter or, or CEO.ca in the next half an hour. Um, and we hope to uh, have a chance to present to you again soon.